If you will, turn in your Bibles to the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning in verse 22, as we continue our study through the Word. Now, Jesus' ministry just continues to gather crowds wherever it goes, and, and Jesus uh, now is headed towards the cross. He's in the, the final weeks and months of his ministry. And so for three years, he has been declaring that the kingdom of God is at hand. For three years, he has been declaring that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and and there is no other way except uh, through him. You remember that the religious leaders have been opposing him as Jesus set forth his credentials. He has showed the nation that he has power and authority over illness, over sickness, over every single disease. He has demonstrated that the wind and the waves and even creation obey him. The demonic realm is subject to his authority, and he has declared that he has come from heaven, that he himself is the Messiah, and he is the one that is going to lead the nation. You remember that the religious leaders are declaring, yes, he has great power and authority. That is absolutely true. But his power and authority is not from heaven. It is from below. And so Jesus now, knowing that the invitation that he has given to the nation is being rejected, is now going to begin to focus his invitation on an individual basis. On every single heart, on every single life, you have to make that decision as to who do you say that I am? And do you believe the claims that Jesus is making? Jesus is making an exclusive claim. He's declaring that there is no other way into heaven except uh, through him, that there is a new covenant, the kingdom of God, that the doors are being offered and you are being invited to come in. You remember last time that he warned the, the, the crowds and the disciples about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He talked about the leaven of the Pharisees as being the hypocrisy. As these were the, the religious leaders, these were the ones that the people looked up to for their spiritual guidance. And remember that Jesus said that on the outside they have a form of righteousness, but on the inside, they are filled with dead men's bones rotting. That they have no true relationship with God and that it is all a show. He said, don't be concerned about those people that have authority over your physical life. He goes, but it is over your eternal life. He talked about the first and the second death. The first death is the separation of your soul from your body. But the second death is the separation of your soul from God's presence. And so here we see that Jesus now is, is ministering with a, a passion now. And I believe that, that as the shadow of the cross, as he now is drawing nearer to that cross, that now he is pressing the people to make an individual decision. He says, he who will confess me before men, him I will also confess before my heavenly father. But if you will reject me before men, then I will reject you before my heavenly father. And so now he's making it personal to everybody. The crowds were large, but the crowds were not made up of people that had accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and that had believed their claims. He was a fascination. I mean, the, the, there were people that were coming and bringing his need, their needs to him. All the sick were coming and those people that were in need. But the other people were showing up to see what he was going to say. He was the popular thing to do. The masses were moving wherever Jesus was. It was kind of like you call up your friend, you know, hey, what are you doing today? Oh, I don't know, I'm not doing anything. Hey, you want to go over and see what Jesus is doing? See any miracles he might be doing? Sure, let's go. We'll get a kosher taco on the way and, you know, and head off to go see Jesus, you know. And, uh, and so it was kind of, you know, this cultural thing that was, you know, that was happening. But Jesus is cutting through the cultural thing and he's forcing everybody to make a decision with the information that they have. Who do you say that I am? And that is really the issue that Jesus is presenting here. 
We see that in Jesus and talked about the importance now of the perspective of the eternal versus the temporal and how we can get so caught up in the temporal things in our lives that we forget about the most important thing in our life. And what is the single most important thing in our life? And that is our connection to God and an eternal connection to God. He talked about the businessman who worked so hard building his career, late hours at the office, dedication, commitment, sacrifice, perseverance. The man was making money, making a career, and, and his wife was a little disappointed at the time that he was putting in. She missed him and was always constantly clamoring for time with him, but he felt like as soon as he could get himself situated and set, he would have time for her. The, the kids, he was vaguely aware that they were growing up, and he was missing some milestones, but he was convinced that everything that he was doing, he was doing for them. When in reality, it was all for himself. Because even if they didn't exist at all, he would be working this hard and he would be chasing after his career. His money continued to increase. His fame, his success continued to increase. And, and then the opportunity that he had been waiting for. Amazon.com initial stock offering came. <laughs> And he went all in with his money on that, believing that this was going to be the future. He leveraged himself out, and he hit an absolute home run. Amazon took over the world, uh, and their stock went to exorbitant prices, and he was set for life. He finally now was ready to spend time with his wife and to spend time with the kids and to be able to enjoy the life that he had now created. But that very night, his life was required of him. And he left all of it behind. There was a big funeral. People stood up and spoke at his funeral, said what an amazing businessman he was, innovative, passionate, and committed, great leader of men. These were all the, the words that were used of him, and they were put onto his tombstone. And after the crowds had all departed, an angel came from heaven and looked at the tombstone of this man and wrote a word across his gravestone. Fool. That was God's judgment upon this man. What does it profit a man if you are to gain the whole world and lose your, your soul? He was so consumed chasing after success that he never had time to connect with God. He never secured his eternal relationship with the Lord. And the things of the temporal became the only blessings that he ever had in his entire life. And now he would face eternal separation from God. Jesus gives the parable of the rich fool and he closes in on the heart of the gospel message, which is you were created by God for the purpose of being in relationship with him and loving others. And everything else in life is a distraction from those two key elements that are in a person's life. Here in this 12th chapter, we are going to see that Jesus is going to talk about the life that God created you to live. And God wants you to enjoy your life. No, I'm going to say that again. God wants you to what? Enjoy your, life. enjoy your life. He created you for fellowship with him. He created the earth as a place for you to dwell, to enjoy his creation that, that he has made. He put man as the crown of his creation and gave dominion over all the earth to mankind, to enjoy it, to marvel at it, to, to enjoy marriage, family, friendships, to enjoy God, and to enjoy this gift of this life that we have been given. And so he is going to give some life lessons as he looks upon the way that we are living our lives. 
and how far off of the mark we, we are in chasing after what God desires for our lives. And finally, he's going to talk about being ready, being ready for the most important appointment that there is in a person's life. And that is when that person stands before God. And are you ready? That's really the question that Jesus is going to pose. Are you ready? Because tomorrow isn't promised to anybody. And this life is all about being ready for the next life and making sure that you have used the temporal to secure the eternal. Let's watch as Jesus continues to minister. He is focused on the cross, laying down his life, covering our sins, and inviting everybody into this new covenant relationship with the creator God of the universe. We pick it up here in Luke's gospel, chapter 12, beginning in verse 22, and it says, Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. So Jesus says, therefore I say to you, do not worry. How many of us worry? How many of us are anxious about anything that's uh, in our lives that have anxiety or stress or concerns or burdens that just weigh us down and listen and keep us from enjoying the life that God has created for us? Here we see that he is ministering to the heart of every single person. God created us and God loves us and God wants us to enjoy the life that he has given to us. But so oftentimes, rather than enjoying our life, we are stressed out and filled with worry and great concerns over everything and anything that's going on in our lives. Not only do we worry all of the time, but because of technology, we are plugged in all of the time. We are now living in a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week, mainstream revolving door that's whirling and spinning at an ever-faster rate. I remember growing up watching Get Smart. <laughs> And whenever he was going to make a phone call, he'd take his shoe off and stick his shoe up to his ear and, and make these phone calls off of his shoe. I thought, how cool is that? And then you had Dick Tracy, who could actually take a phone call and talk on his watch. And, and it seemed like fantasy that these things would ever become a reality. But with the technology explosion that, that we have seen, we now carry around not cell phones. See, I don't even call them a cell phone anymore because they're not really a phone. They're a computer now that happens to make phone calls. They are supercomputers. They were telling me that there is more power in a cell phone today than it was in the NASA computers that put the first man uh, on the moon. More computing power that we're walking around with in our pockets. And we are connected to to everything at all times. We get text messages and phone calls and news alerts and, uh, and all sorts of things are dinging and buzzing and, uh, on cell phones. Phone, phones have to, we need announcements uh, in church to tell people to turn your computers off, please. Uh, uh, but all of that creates an anxiety the stress, the speed of life. What am I missing out on and what's going on? And, and Jesus says, do not worry. I was reading about the prescription drugs, the sedatives, and there we go. So, <laughs> hold on. Yes, honey? Did you want me? <laughs> But about the prescription drugs and sedatives and how many people now are on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications because the stress of living today and in our culture is just getting to too many people. And what does Jesus say? Do not worry. Do not worry. I want you to imagine, just imagine this with me. Imagine if for one week, this next week, you didn't worry about anything at all in your entire life. One week without worry. 
what would you do with all your time then? You know, if, you, if you're not going to worry, you know, if you're, what, what would you do? You would be so free to just enjoy each other and to enjoy God and to enjoy life. And that's what God is trying to do. He's trying to free us from the worry that is consuming our lives, that is eroding our relationships, that is deteriorating our health, and is so far from, from the relationship that God desires for us to have. He's going to reason with us. I love the way God reasons with us. He's going to talk about worry. And these aren't just suggestions. He, he is really concerned about the state of our soul and the way in which we live our lives. And so he says to us, you know, do not worry. What is it that you worry about? He's going to first begin with the basics, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you look like, what others are going to think about you, the, the concerns of life. And he says, do not worry about that. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. He says, consider the ravens, verse 24, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Now, you remember that God's love for you, he had just said earlier, that his thoughts towards you, that he has the very hairs on your head numbered, and that not one sparrow falls to the earth without God's awareness, that God provides for the, <laughs> the sparrows, and that he knows every single thing about you. That's his level of concern and intimacy towards you and that God even takes care of the ravens. Now, the sparrows, they're considered, remember to the Jewish mind, everything is in a clean or unclean focus. And so sparrows are a clean animal, but ravens are considered to be an unclean animal because they're scavengers. And so here, what did Jesus just say? That God even cares about the unclean animals and is providing for the unclean animals. So if God is providing even for the unclean animals, then how much more is he going to provide for you? If he cares about sparrows and ravens and bunny rabbits and, and he provides for all of them, is he not going to provide for you? Mankind was the capstone of God's creation. He had created nature, and then he created mankind, and then he gave mankind dominion over a hall of creation. And if God is concerned about his creation, is he not more concerned about you? And so the first issue is, do you not know how much God loves you? Do you not recognize that he's got your back? If God be for you, who can be against you? If you recognize and really believe that God's got your back, then how would that free you up? And how would that allow you to live your life? And so here he is going to, to talk about not worrying and not being stressed out. He says in verse 25, and which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So he's going to ask this question. How profitable is it for you to worry? How much have you been able to change by worrying in your life? Take all the worry that you've ever worried in your entire life and put it on one side, and then how much change did it actually equate into on the other side? Zero? Okay, what's the definition of insanity? <laughs> when you continue the same action without any chance of a different outcome to that action and hoping for a different outcome, isn't that the definition of insanity? So why are you worrying? No, I'm serious. Why are you worrying? <laughs> and we see how counterproductive it is. First of all, he says that by worrying, you can't change your stature. Your stature is your height. So he says, who by worrying can change how tall they are? I think of that person that's four foot 11 and three quarters. <laughs> <laughs> they want that last quarter inch to get to five foot or five feet in tall. And, and, and by worrying, how much worry do you have to do in order to get to five uh, feet? 
You can hang on stretching rags, you can do whatever you want. You cannot change your height by worrying. And he's saying, if you can't even change your height by worrying, and he says, your height is nothing compared to the power of God. A person's height is nothing. Who determines a person's height? God. Before you were born, he already determined the, the body that he would give to you. And, and so if you can't even change just even a quarter inch. Now, a cubit is 18 inches. So when he says, who can change their height by 18 inches by worrying? And if you're not even able to do that, which is such a small thing compared to the omnipotence of God, if you can't even control your height by worry, then how would you ever be able to control things that are significant? In verse 26, if, then, if you then are not able to do the least, that's control your height, why are you anxious for the rest? Why are you trying to control things? That's really what it comes down to. Worry is all about the future outcome of circumstances and events. And so if we do not have that capacity to change things through worry, then why are we doing it? And I, and I think that it's really a good question to stop and to ask ourselves. Because we can get into destructive habits that just are then habits. That, that when there's a situation or a circumstance, then we just funnel into this is the way that I just process stress or anxiousness that's in my life without actually stopping and asking, how did I get here? And what is the way out of here? And how do I improve the quality of my life? The Word of God has the answer for how you can improve the quality of your life. Why? Because he's the designer. And he created you and he made you. And he knows exactly what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing for your body to operate healthy and successful. And he says, you've got to get the worry out of your life. He says, so first of all, is it profitable? The answer is absolutely not. It's not profitable in one bit. It's not even a little bit profitable whatsoever. So first of all, it's not profitable. Secondly, is it destructive to your body? Yes. I mean, study after study about worrying, about anxiousness and what it does. It creates stomach acid, increases your blood pressure, it releases toxins into your body. I mean, there are all types of things that stress and anxiety are not good for the body that God created. And so God is saying, stop doing that. That's not good for you. That's not going to get you where you need to go. So first, recognize that that's not God's will for your life. That's not pleasing to God. So think about that. It's not pleasing to God for you to be sitting there and worrying about what's going to happen. Why? Because God is the one that's in control. Amen? So what we need to do is to trust God and we need to rest in God's capacity to be able to handle the future. So here's a question that I've got. When you're worrying, what is it that is so important that you're not trusting God with? That you need to help him by worrying. <laughs> God, I don't really trust you on this one. This is a big one here. It's about my promotion tomorrow. I'm just going to wring my hands for a few hours and help you with just a few hours of worrying so that I can get my promotion. It's when you stop and tear it apart and look at it, that the basis of worry is not trusting God. That's the basis. That's the seed root. If you are worried, if you are anxious in your life, it's because you're not trusting God. You're not resting in God. So if you're not trusting God, then who are you going to have to trust? Yourself. See, so you're trusting yourself now. And if you're going to trust yourself in your life, then you've got a lot to worry about. <laughs> right? If you're only going to rely, listen, if you're only going to rely on your own resources for your life, 
then, man, how much resources do you need? You know, a lot of resources. If you're going to try and come up with every contingency and come up with, you know, the plan to insulate your life and protect yourself from, from everything else, then you've got a lot to be afraid of. And then once, here's the other illusion. The other belief is, is that if I just had enough money, then I could insulate myself and then I would be happy. That's why most people think, if, you know, if money will make them happy. If I can just get to this place, then I will be happy. But here's the reality. They think that their problems go away when they have money. But the exact opposite actually ends up happening. Because when you start to accumulate a lot of money, then what starts to happen is you start to worry that you're going to lose all of that, <laughs> that money. And then you start to be afraid that everybody is going to try and take your money. And then you start building security systems and defenses and vaults and private investing. And you, and you now, everybody becomes a potential enemy that is going to try and rob you and plunder you and swindle you or trick you or separate you from your money. And now you have to worry about all of these things about your money. And the very thing that you thought was going to set you free is far from sets you free. So what are you worried about again? What is it that you are not trusting God? That God has your back. And if you really believe and understand that God's got your back, then you are able to be able to start to let go and start to trust him with the outcome in your life. You're worried about your job? God knows that you need a job. You're worried about who you're going to marry? God knows who you're going to marry. You're worried about the provision for your life? God knows what your needs are. God has got you. God has got you. He knows when you're going to die. He knows what your retirement is going to look like. He knows the provision that he makes. He loves you. You can wonder about it. You can plan for it. He wants you to use your intelligence, the knowledge, and the wisdom. He doesn't want you to worry about it. When you're worrying, you're not able to love others. Because worrying causes you to turn inward instead of outward. And so love doesn't flow lavishly out of a heart that is worried and that is concerned. And so God really wants you to move past worrying in your life. To get victory over your anxiousness and over your fear. Fear not. Do not be afraid is the number one negative commandment in the Bible. God says it over and over and over and over. Why? Because he knows that we're prone to it. But Jesus is reasoning with us. He's reasoning with us to let it go. It's not productive. It's not going to change anything. He says, oh, you of little faith. He says... Verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little what? O oh, you of little faith. And so here again, God's provision. He knows what you need. You need clothes. He knows that you need clothes. And Jesus looks at the hillside. Now, the hillside is a dirt hillside. But what does God do with that dirt hillside? He says, you know what, I'm going to cover that. In the springtime, he just lays out this velvet grass on the fields that you see over in Israel when you travel. And then on top of the field, what does he do? He sprinkles it with the most amazing wildflowers over in Israel. There are wildflowers all throughout the wild grass that they have. And these incredible pop of color that you see against the green. And God did that just to cover dirt. He's like, you know what, let's just cover that up and give that a garment. He says, Solomon, with all of his finery, he never was as magnificently dressed as I dressed that dirt over there. And how much more important are you than just a hillside? God knows that you need to be covered. He knows that. He knows that you need clothing. He's going to make sure that you've got the provision that is necessary in your life. 
He says, and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your father knows that you need these things. If he's got the hairs on your head numbered, does he not know the rest of your needs? If he is that concerned, he knows when you rise up and when you lie down in the morning, does he not have your back on these things? He says, but seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Seeking the kingdom of God means that we're not consumed with the life that we're living, but that we're consumed with the relationship that we've been invited into. And if we will seek that first, just draw near to the Lord, in his presence is the fullness of what? Joy, the fullness of joy is found in his presence, seeking fulfillment in your relationship with God versus seeking fulfillment or protection or control from the environment that is around you. He says, and all these things will be added to you. Relationship first. The rest of the stuff, God's going to take care of that. If you're connected to him, you can trust him. If you're not connected to him, then you need to hurry up and go take care of everything because everything is going to be a problem in your life. Or seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. I like the way King David put it. He said, the Lord is my my shepherd. I shall not want. See, David was a shepherd. And the shepherd knew that the care of the flock was contingent upon the quality of the shepherd. A good shepherd was going to take good care of the flock. A good shepherd would know how to lead them into green pastures. You see, in the summertime, it gets very hot in Israel, but up in higher altitude, it's cool in the summertime. And so shepherds would have their upper pastures, would move the flock up into the cooler temperatures in the summertime. And then when it starts to get cold as winter is starting to come, move them back down into the valley where it's warmer and the, and the green grass it is. And so a good shepherd is going to move the flock around. He knows where those fields are. The Lord is my shepherd. He's the one that's taking care of me. I, I can trust that. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Green pastures. That's a good shepherd. Uh, leads them to green pastures. Versus brown pastures. Brown pastures aren't so good. Green pastures are good. He leads me beside the still waters. Still waters. Do you know that sheep are skittish by nature? They're anxious. They worry. They're stressed out. They need everything to be really calm and peaceful and restful. And then they can relax. In fact, they are so skittish and they are so stressed out. Do you know that they will not drink from moving water? No, I don't know the water's moving. We can't drink out of this. <laughs> they won't drink out of a river. They will not drink out of moving water. They're too afraid of the water moving. They, they will not drink. They need still water. It's still. You can come and drink from it. Okay. Try this. He leads us into green pastures. He, he puts us beside still waters. Shh. Take it down about 10 degrees. <laughs> Relax. Rest. You're well taken care of. You have a good shepherd that's watching out for your back. He's going to make sure that you've got the provision that you need in your life. He restores my soul. I'm good. I can rest in him. Cast all your cares on him for he, he cares for you. He restores your soul. What's the condition of your soul today? What's the condition of your soul? 
This is interesting how we have mirrors to be able to tell us the condition of our bodies, right? We look in mirrors and mirrors will tell us, you know, how, how we look. And then we kind of navigate according to how we look. Our hair is a mess or this. We can fix ourselves up. And, and then, you know, you have these, these things that I think personally they ruin a lot of vacations. And, and those are in hotels. They have those lighted magnified mirrors that you can see yourself in. Like, who wants to know they look like that? You know, I mean, up close you see these craters and things and hair hairs are growing and all kinds of stuff. It's like, I just, you just ruined my vacation with having that thing, you know, in here. And, you know, and, and, and so we see ourselves, you know, what do we, what do we look like, you know, on the physical? And I thought, imagine if you could have a mirror that showed you what your soul looked like in the condition of your soul. You could look into this and, and actually see your soul. And then here's the question. What magnification would you like to see your soul, you know, uh, add? And of course you would need a lighted mirror to be able to see every aspect of your soul. Do you know that's what the Word of God is? It's that mirror that you can see your soul in. And it's lit, the light of the world lights that mirror so you can see who you are. Not the outside, the inside. How are you doing? Not, how's your body doing? So many times say, how are you doing? And people will answer that with, you know, the circumstances. They'll answer about their body. Well, my knee hurts and, you know, I got this pain in my back and, you know, that's good. And how are you doing? Good. We just got back from a trip. That's good. How are you doing? How's your soul doing? Is it all like this? Or is it calm, resting, trusting, and peace with God, and peace with others? As much as depends upon yourself beyond peaceable terms with all people. What's the state of your soul today? When God would look at the crowds, when Jesus would look at the crowds, you know what he sees? He sees their souls. He sees how they really are doing. Not what they're projecting and pretending, but how are you really doing? And here's what he's saying to us today. Do not worry. Trust. I've got you. It's good. Your life is going to move forwards. I'm going to see you through everything. I'm going to lead you in the green pastures. I'm going to put you beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You see, I'm comforted by his rod and his staff because that's my shepherd that's got my back. And he's loaded for bear. He's got the stick, he's got the club, he's got the staff, and he's going to protect me with those. Huh. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup <laughs> runs over, and surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell the house of the Lord. For how long? Forever. Is he your good and shepherd? Can you rest and trust in him? What's the condition of your soul? Don't worry. Don't get caught up in the commercial and consumerism of our culture. Don't put your value in your external. Put your value as a child of God. But your value and your relationship with him. Learn to look in the mirror of your soul and say, soul, why are you disquieted today? Soul, why are you downcast today? Surely I will put my hope and my trust in the Lord <laughs> in whatever circumstance you might find yourself in. In verse 32, he says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure 
to give you the kingdom. See, do not fear little flock or lambs with the good shepherd. And it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of God and to be connected with them. He says, sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. He says, don't store up your treasures here on earth, but use the treasure that you have to store up treasure in heaven. And what is treasure in heaven? Love. See, use what you have to love others. What good is it if you gather together a pile of money and then you never bless anybody with that money? No love. But but take what you have and turn it into love. That's treasure in heaven. You invested it wisely. You didn't just gather it. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then he basically gives a parable about be ready. Be ready. Be ready to meet God. Whenever that time is, no man knows the day or the hour. And that's really the question that that the scriptures ask and I'm going to ask. Are you ready? He says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. That's a, that's a, a ready servant. He says, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. And blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. And assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. So he's talking about the reward of a faithful servant that is up whenever the master is going to return, is in a constant state of readiness. And it says in verse 38, and if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. And therefore you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The Son of Man is coming at an hour that we don't expect. We are waiting right now for the return of Christ to gather his bride in the rapture of the church. The Bible tells us that the world is going to continue to tremble, that it is going to continue to shake, and that it is going to continue to start to to break down. And that that's one of the signs that he is going to come and, and take his bride right off of this earth. That Israel will be a, a, couple of, a cup of trembling and Jerusalem in and of itself. And today we see Jerusalem in the news that it is a, a cup of trembling, whether or not the embassies of the world should be in Jerusalem or not. We see that at any moment, the Lord could return. It had to happen after the nation was regathered back into its homeland, and that is done. We see the alliances and the scriptures exactly forming uh, as God said that they were going to. And so we have the picture in front of us, and the Lord is saying, be ready. Be ready. And that's the question. Are you ready? Jesus said that if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my heavenly Father. That you need a Savior, and I am the Savior that has come to rescue you and to save you. And now he's asking, will you have me? Will you receive me into an eternal relationship together? He says, I'm the door, there's no other way. And I've come to pay the price to be able to redeem you and to have you for myself. And so for three years, he's been dating the nation of Israel. For three years, he's been giving them gifts and blessings and showing them how much he loves them and that he is who he says. He's feeding the masses. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He is blessing everybody around. And now he's asking them, to enter into a covenant relationship with him. The new covenant that he came down to establish. When a man has been dating a woman that he loves for a period of time, there is a gesture that's universally recognized and understood. (laughs) 
when he gets down onto one knee and, and suddenly a, a little box appears from nowhere. And that box is opened up and presented to the woman that he's been courting and that he loves. And that ring in that box says, I love you and I want you to be mine forever and I want to be yours. And I want to start a new relationship and a new life together. Will you have me? And the invitation is given to come and be mine. I have gotten to know you and I love you and you have gotten to know me. And now I want to know, are we ready to covenant into this grand new adventure, this new life together? I want you to know that there are some women when they are given that invitation that say no. And that box is closed and it's put back into the pocket and there is a broken heart that departs. But there are others that say yes. Yes. A thousand times. Yes. And I want you to know that that the Lord is on his knees this morning before you. And he has a box and inside of that box is the Holy Spirit that he gives to every single person that says yes. He says, I love you. I want to be with you for all eternity. I want to enter into a covenant relationship with you and, and we will never be separated. And this is yours if you want me. I want you. Will you have me? Will you be mine? And there are two answers that will come back. No. To which point, the Lord's heart is broken. For he made you, knitted you together, and has been waiting for the moment that you will say yes and come into his arms and enter into an eternal love affair. But he will not force he will not pout. He will not shame. He will not condemn. He will not coerce. He is the perfect gentleman. He will just simply be heartbroken. And then there are those that say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord, a thousand times. Yes, Lord. And we enter into that relationship with the Lord. And it is life transforming. And it is eternal. And this day, every single one of us is in one of those two camps. And the Lord, as assuredly as I stand here before you or kneel before you, the Lord is kneeling here today. His arms are wide open. The gift of the Holy Spirit is yours. And all you need to do is come and receive that gift and say, yes, Lord, I am yours forever. And if you would like to do that as we worship, then stand up right where you are, make your way down here, and I will lead you in that invitation that accepts Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He's been courting you and loving you, and now he's asking, will you have him? And if the answer is yes, and stand up and come forward and receive Christ now. Come just as you are.